Hi, I'm Eric Fish. And I'm doing this class app for the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia program at the University of Colorado. And I'm the author of the book, China's Millennials, The Want Generation. Um, so this book kind of came about um, when I moved to China. It seemed that a lot of narratives, popular narratives that were being put forward in the media uh, and a lot of stories were kind of lagging behind uh, the reality uh, that was very quickly shifting. And I think it's very interesting when a country is going through such rapid, uh, profound economic, social, even political change like China is, uh, it's usually the young generation, the people just coming of age that are most vividly influenced by it and best reflect these changes uh, because they're uh, having their outlook shaped by these changes and they don't have the same baggage uh, that their parents do. Uh, so I really wanted to try to capture uh, a lot of the issues that this young generation of millennials, which I define as born between about the mid-1980s and the mid-1990s, uh, just really what they're going through and how their outlook is shifting. Now, I said that uh, a lot of the narratives that I was sort of trying to challenge uh, that emerged in the media, um, on one hand, looking back at previous generations, I think especially when you look at the generation that protested at Tiananmen in 1989, I think that uh, a lot of journalists have gone back at periodic points like on anniversaries and said, well, why haven't young people pushed uh, for some lofty uh, goal like more political rights like students did in 1989? And it seems that the answer people go back to a lot is that on one hand, China's economy has grown so much uh, that young people have been bought off and made sort of materialistic, too much so to care about uh, more uh, you know, lofty uh, political goals. And on the other hand, uh, very nationalistic. We've seen in recent years with protests against Japan uh, that have turned quite violent in some cases, as well as protests against Western countries like France and the United States, uh, that the government has really relied on nationalism to distract attention. And I think that this narrative still holds some currency. Uh, and I think for a time that was a very good way of explaining things, but I think we're pretty quickly moving away from that. And I wanted to depict how, uh, how this is happening uh, and what influences this is having on China. So a couple things I'm gonna talk about in my talk, the growing individualism and ambition among young Ch uh, Chinese youth uh, that is challenging this uh, stereotype that's been held for a while now the increasing willingness of young people to speak out and stick their necks out uh, for things that may not benefit them directly. Uh, and then I want to get into the emerging economic challenges, um, kind of pushing against this idea also that young Chinese have been bought off. Uh, a lot of challenges are, tr are starting to hit them quite uh, harshly. So I want to talk a little bit about those and then some unique social issues that are emerging in China uh, and especially heavily hitting the young people. So, uh, as I mentioned before uh, about this narrative of uh, materialistic and nationalistic youth uh, and where this came from, uh, 1989 really was a turning point with the Tiananmen protests because before then, uh, China had for a decade started to embrace capitalism, uh, but it still relied on socialist ideology, kind of the idea of proletarian internationalism and class struggle. Uh, and people could just look around them and see uh, what a lie that was. Uh, reality completely contradicted uh, what they were being taught in school. Uh, and a lot of people, uh, st information started trickling in from the West, um, vague notions of democracy and personal freedoms. And in spite of things being open, a lot of young people uh, really felt restricted still and heard about things they were missing and expectations started to get ahead. Uh, so after Tiananmen happened, after the crackdown, the government kind of had to reinvent itself. So one thing it did was shift from socialist education to a more nationalistic education, emphasizing the century of humiliation, as it's known in China, between the Opium War and World War II, the Japanese invasion. And this education goes that China was this illustrious 5,000-year-old civilization, uh, that was then brought to its knees by foreign aggressors. And it wasn't until the Communist Party liberated China in 1949 that it started to bring it back to a place of respect on the world stage. Uh, so that education has tried to shift um, 
attention away from domestic troubles to foreign enemies, uh, in a sense. But then part of that even more uh, vivid uh, was how China started to restructure the economy after Tiananmen. In the, mid in the early 1990s, it really started to privatize the economy, dismantling state-owned enterprises. And you can see from this chart here, uh, about the mid-1990s, economic growth, uh, China's per capita GDP really started to tick upward. And then 2001, China joined the WTO, started really integrating into the international economy and growth just exploded from there. Now, if you were uh, an adult uh, as this was happening in the mid 90s, early 2000s, I think that this did have a pretty pacifying effect. Uh, people who had uh, been used to very restricted lives, uh, a lot of economic hardship, they saw things really start to improve. Uh, the state started to back away from people's personal lives and really people had more freedom, more economic opportunity than they'd ever had in Chinese history. So if you remember the bad old days, uh, then I think this did really have a profound impact on keeping people happy. The problem today, though, from the government standpoint is that now you have people coming of age that were born amid this uptick, uh, the early to mid 90s, uh, especially they were born into an era of rapid uh, economic growth, and they're starting to sort of take it for granted and think that uh, economic growth is not enough. Young people are starting to want a lot more uh, out of life than that, and I think you see that in a lot of different ways. And the other big implication of this is uh, information that's available. So in the year 2000, almost nobody was on the internet. Uh, today, more than half of China's online. That's even more acute among young people. Almost 80% of teenagers are internet users. So now you have people uh, getting exposed to all this information, challenging what they're taught in schools, challenging the party line, but also just exposing them to all kinds of different ideas and lifestyles. Um, if somebody has uh, a hobby or a lifestyle that's used to be taboo in China, now they can go online and see that they're not alone. And it's really allowing people to branch out and become much more individualistic and explore more personal identity, uh, as well as become more cynical of the party line. A couple stats that I think help bear this out. Uh, today, about 15% of Chinese adults are single. Now, that's up from 6% in 1990, so almost triple uh, over the past two and a half decades. And I think this is one way of measuring how people are breaking away from uh, traditional practices. Uh, I think still the status quo in China is that you work hard, get into a good school, get a good stable job after graduation, make as much money as you can, get married, have a baby. Uh, that's what the older generation still by and large wants their kids to do. Uh, but you see more and more people rejecting this and wanting to kind of trace their own path. Uh, so this is very quickly uh, developing. Now it's still, if you compare to the United States, about half of adults are single. So China is not quite up to the uh, individualist level that the U.S. is, but I think it's very rapidly heading in that direction. Another interesting stat, 62% of China's religious believers are between 16 and 49. So this goes against the trend in many uh, Western developed countries of the elderly people being more religious. In China, it's the young people becoming more religious. And I think this again speaks to people, uh, younger people increasingly wanting more spiritual fulfillment, wanting more of a sense of meaning in life than just chasing uh, a paycheck. Uh, and I think religion is one way of measuring this, uh, the easiest way maybe, but you see this in all sorts of different ways, people doing volunteering, traveling, uh, and pushing different social uh, issues and activism, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit. Uh, and this is uh, having a lot of different influences. So these are some people I talked to in my book, some young environmentalists who uh, went into NGOs and both of them kind of had a similar story. The one on the left started uh, a environmental NGO to increase transparency about businesses that might have a detrimental environmental effect. The one on the right uh, went into uh, an environmental group that wants to make universities greener. And in talking to them, they both had similar backgrounds. They'd grown up middle class, pretty well off uh, economically, and they traveled a lot, and that really gave them an appreciation for how fragile the environment was. So they wanted to dedicate their lives to uh, pushing back against uh, all the environmental destruction happening in China. And stats bear this out as well. 63% of Chinese age 18 to 35 say a lot of people my age are seeking jobs that give back to society. 
So these are people working kind of within the system, uh, dedicating their careers to making a positive change, even though that's not the most lucrative career option. But you see this more and more uh, the younger you get in China. But even more people are willing to do things slightly outside of the system, which I think is an equally interesting uh, development. 78% say my generation isn't afraid to take up a cause and do it ourselves if higher powers fail to act quickly or adequately. Now you see here people that were involved in a large-scale environmental protest in 2007 in Xiamen when a chemical factory wanted to move to town. And before that, you had never seen any kind of large-scale urban environmental protest like this. Uh, but this was largely led by high school, university students spreading messages, and then people took to the streets. And it was really a milestone because in the years after that, you've seen all kinds of very similar protests in different cities around China where you have tens of thousands of people taking to the streets, uh, protesting against uh, environmental degradation. Uh, some other people I looked at in the book, social activists. Uh, so these are some feminist activists, the one on the left here named Li Tingting. Uh, she had organized all these kind of cheeky protests, raising awareness of women's rights, and she suffered pretty badly for it. Uh, she did things like organize uh, women to wear blood splattered wedding gowns to protest domestic abuse or protesting to have a higher ratio of female toilets. and. Pretty innocuous, but there was a lot of backlash against her. She was harassed a lot by police, and then last year it made international news uh, in 2015 when uh, her and four other feminist activists were arrested for more than a month. And uh, I, I talked to her, and she, I asked, like, basically, how much of an impact do you think? Do you think you can really change things in China by doing this? And she said, well, if you fight for something, you shouldn't fight for it because you think it can be achieved. You should fight for it because it's right. And this was an attitude among a lot of young people I really encountered, really willing to stick their necks out for lofty change uh, when a lot of harm can be brought to them personally and very little tangible personal benefit. But again, this is a trend you see in young people. And then I thought the most significant was this event in 2013 where a liberal southern uh, weekend newspaper, uh, its reporters had a conflict with its censor. They had tried to write this critical editorial about constitutionalism, and it was censored into this puff piece glorifying the Communist Party. Uh, but the reporters went on strike, word leaked out, and young people across the country uploaded pictures of themselves uh, supporting the newspaper, uh, supporting free speech. And uh, even more remarkably, hundreds showed out, up outside the newspaper's offices uh, protesting for freedom of press, freedom of speech. And the picture in the lower right corner here, I think, speaks volumes. When police were at this protest walking around taking pictures, trying to intimidate protesters, and you can see by this young woman's reaction, the V for victory, uh, about how well that worked. Um, I really think that this speaks to a breakdown in respect for authority. Uh, the young generation doesn't have the scars of the Cultural Revolution, they don't have the memory of the Tiananmen crackdown, and they were really born into an area of unprecedented personal freedom, and they really don't have the same regard, the same fear of Big Brother uh, as their parents did, and I think that's really emboldening sort of activist actions like that. So that's kind of half of the story that I wanted to get across. Uh, that the fact that young people are becoming more demanding, higher expectations, and more willing to speak out uh, on behalf of those expectations. The other half is that the economic and social reality in China is actually getting quite a bit more difficult for young people, especially. Now, China's GDP growth for a very long time was double digits or near double digits, uh, very torrid economic growth, but now it's very steadily declining, uh, where in the next couple of years it's expected to keep declining even further. Now, you look at these numbers, 6.9, 6.5, that might not seem like uh, scary uh, growth by American standards, but in China, when you've expected to grow by so much each year, there was a lot of investment that was counting on much higher growth. You see massive debt problems, massive infrastructure overinvestment. Uh, a lot of companies are having a really hard time staying afloat and staying competitive in China's uh, old growth model, which relied on cheap labor and cheap exports, that's really starting to dry up and hurt China's economy in a lot of different ways. Uh, and again, it's young people, when there's economic trouble, that tend to be the most uh, acutely impacted by it. They're the ones entering the workforce. And one group that I uh, looked at was factory workers and how this is playing out. 
Now, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been a massive uh, influx in factory protests, and I this is uh, kind of how I tried to do a couple different chapters, trying to compare earlier generations. And I look back at workers in the 1990s based on older studies, older interviews of uh, factory workers at that time. And they really kind of gave a vision of workers that kept their head down. They were there to make money uh, and then go back to their hometown after a couple of years and almost never would uh, stick their neck out uh, to complain to a boss or go on strike was almost unheard of uh, in the 90s. Uh, but now you see this becoming very, very common. So this chart uh, is done by a group that tracks labor unrest in China uh, month by month. So you look at the very left, January 2011, they tracked eight uh, worker strikes in all of China. Five years later, by January 2016, they counted 503. Now, there's a lot of different reasons for this. Uh, the economic slowdown is putting more pressure on companies, making things more contentious. Uh, but I don't think you can... Uh, uh, diminish the importance of the young people. Uh, most workers are under 30 still, and how much more willing they are to fight for their rights, how better uh, empowered they are by all the means of communication they have, smartphones, the internet, whatnot, to learn about what's going on, learn about their rights, and communicate with each other, and really take this collective action and stick their necks out more. Uh, some other big economic issues, if you move up the economic food chain, is the glut of college graduates. So uh, almost every year in China now, you see the same story. A uh, quarter million more new graduates than last year, 10, 15, 20 percent fewer jobs waiting for them. Uh, college enrol enrollments has just been growing by leaps and bounds o over the past few years in China. And China's economy has not been able to absorb all of those white collar college graduates that are entering the workforce. So on one hand, you have a lot of graduates with very high expectations when they were taught that working hard, getting through college will guarantee them a white collar stable future. And that's uh, decreasingly the case now. Uh, so this is disillusioning a lot of young educated people with these very high hopes. And you can see this uh, in the labor statistics where people under 25 years old with a bachelor's degree in China have a 16% unemployment rate. I think the, the numbers are even higher now, about double what it was in the United States at this time. And that just, uh, so the more educated you get, as you can see in China, the more dire your employment uh, outlook is, uh, which is very interesting and uh, very threatening in a lot of ways. And kind of compounding this further is a sense of inequality and unfairness in the employment market. This is a picture that went viral on China's microblogs a couple years ago, comparing the guy on the top who came from a good, rich family background in the rat race for employment against the struggling graduate who came from a poor family background uh, who's being expected to support his parents rather than being pushed ahead by them. And people I talked to again and again kind of reiterated this, that if you had come of age early in China's reform period, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit in the economy uh, where if you were capable and smart, you could make a name for yourself. But a lot of those opportunities have dried up and are closing in on an increasingly small circle of elites. And survey data has backed this up as well. Uh, one survey found 80% of people in China believe that young people who achieve career success do so because of their family connections. Only 10% thought that hard work, creativity, and academic achievements beat having a well-connected father. Um, so a lot of disillusionment. And if you look at the numbers to China's wealth inequality by independent estimates is much higher even than America's. Uh, America has infamously bad wealth inequality right now. Uh, but China is kind of off the charts, and no matter who I talked to, no matter how low they were at the most menial jobs, I, I got a sense of this uh, where people felt like if they didn't come from a good background, they were not going to get a great job. So, uh, and then a, a section I want to talk about, uh, I look at a, a book is I uh, called Coping, which talks about the various social issues that are emerging. Uh, both from like the slowdown and some of China's unique uh, policies, like the one-child policy. And I don't have time to talk about all of them, so I'll talk about a couple uh, of the more interesting ones. One of the big ones is this giant gender imbalance. Uh, because of the one-child policy uh, coupled with a traditional preference for sons and sex-selective abortion, China now has 20 million more men of marriage age uh, than it has women of that age cohort. 
and that's growing by about a million every year. So if you look to the future, that's getting worse and worse. Uh, at its peak in China, there were about 120 boys born for every 100 girls. And this is having all sorts of wild side effects. Um, the most obvious one, uh, of course, these 20 million men are never going to find a wife. So this is putting a lot of pressure on young men, especially at the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder, to really accumulate uh, capital, buy a house, uh, getting a lot of pressure, um, especially from their parents, to uh, find a wife at all costs. Uh, a lot of the other side effects, though, are quite uh, scary. There have been all kinds of studies uh, linking increases in crime with a gender imbalance. Single adults, males, are three times more likely to murder than married male adults. Uh, China's even linked uh, about a 4% increase in crime for every 1% increase in the gender imbalance. So all kinds of uh, interesting side effects coming from this. And I tried to talk to men at various uh, points on the uh, economic ladder to see how this is impacting them. Uh, because it is affecting guys at all, all levels in China. Uh, now, to get back to what I mentioned at the beginning, this idea of nationalism uh, kind of distracting young Chinese away from protesting their own government, uh, I had kind of related this in a way to the gender imbalance uh, and how this idea of nationalism distracting people away from domestic leaders is a bit more complicated than it tends to be portrayed. Um, so this is a guy that I talk about uh, in my book that became quite famous in 2012 when there were these huge anti-Japan protests uh, across China. And amid this protest, this guy in Xi'an, uh, a Chinese man was driving through in a Japanese-made Toyota. This guy pulled him out of the car, beat him on the head with a bicycle lock, left him partially paralyzed. And eventually he was arrested, but then reporters started talking to his family and his friends, looking into his background. And they found that he was this migrant worker who had tried to get into college uh, but wasn't smart enough, didn't pass the college entrance exam, so was kind of relegated to menial labor work. He migrated to urban Xi'an to do construction and really had a hard time connecting with anybody. He was really kind of alienated and isolated when he went to do this migrant work. He just escaped into video games every night. And they looked back at his microblog and one post said, please God, grant me a wife. And uh, so he was one of these bare branches, as they're called in China, somebody kind of uh, left behind in this huge gender imbalance, uh, probably never going to find a partner and was really just kind of uh, left afloat because of it. And some of his friends, though, said that uh, when this protest come rolling through, when people got uh, all up in arms about a conflict with Japan, it kind of lit a spark into him gave him a sense of purpose, and he just really got swept up in this protest and turned to violence. And I think this is interesting because you see a lot of examples like this in Chinese history. Uh, in the 19th century, they had a gender imbalance in China as well uh, because of selective neglect uh, of, of young girls. Uh, there were more men, and it kind of resulted in these uh, marauding uh, gangs of men coalescing into larger rebellious movements uh, that challenged the government, the Taiping Rebellion, the Nian Rebellion, Boxer Rebellion, all of these things, quite violent. Um, so nationalism distracting young people uh, from domestic issues, I think, is uh, a bit of a misleading characterization because quite often it can be the exact opposite. And you see in the 20th century as well, many movements that started against foreign powers uh, ended up turning against the Chinese government, uh, which I get to in more detail in the book. But another example, 1985, there were big anti-Japan protests that ended up shifting and started incorporating uh, slogans against corrupt local officials. And eventually that evolved into the Tiananmen movement. So uh, movements critical of the Chinese government have sprouted directly from nationalism. But I would take issue with the idea that uh, this young generation is more nationalistic uh, than the older generation. So one survey found that 37% uh, uh, over Chinese, 30, Chinese over 35 years old view the U.S. favorably, whereas 56% of Chinese under 35 view it favorably. So the younger you get, the more positive attitude Chinese tend to have about the U.S. And the same with Japan. Uh, there was a survey a couple years ago that said people 
uh, born before 1990, 42% uh, of them said that having the military option there uh, in disputes with Japan is okay, whereas slightly fewer, 37% uh, of people born after 1990, said that it's uh, that the military uh, option should be there if disputes get out of hand with Japan. So not a huge difference, but it does kind of challenge this idea uh, of the young generation being more uh, more bloodthirsty, uh, nationalistic, I guess. And going back to this gender imbalance, uh, just to talk about one more interesting social issue, uh, I wanted to see how this was affecting the women. And I talk, uh, the way I kind of structure the book is to really dive deep into personal stories and see how these big unfolding macro level socioeconomic issues are infecting, uh, affecting individuals uh, at the ground level. Uh, so I, I talked to this young woman who was uh, living in rural Shanxi province, and she had made a movie looking at a lot of issues that affect rural women like suicide, sexual harassment, um, exploitation uh, in a lot of different ways. And it turned out she was a non-professional actor uh, that had been chosen to star in the movie because she was really from that background. And her life story, in fact, uh, dealt with a lot of these issues and her migrating to the city, trying to make money, uh, but being harassed, exploited in a lot of different ways and really being left at the bottom of, of, of society uh, uh, because of her gender and her rural background. And again, I was kind of focusing on this story because it does speak to larger trends. One statistic that really caught my eye when I was researching this book, uh, you would expect that as China uh, develops economically that it would be uh, more inclusive of women uh, but it, actually the opposite is the case. In 1990, urban women made 78% of what their male counterparts made uh, wage-wise. Rural women made 79%, uh, but 20 years later, both had fallen. Urban women only made 67% of what men did. Rural women got an even worse deal. They're now making 56% of what their male counterparts did. And when you extrapolate this out, when you have on one hand a... Uh, Ur urban male cohort that's becoming wealthy very quickly and rural women that are not as quickly uh, reaping the rewards of China's growth. What does this mean when you have this increasing power and wealth gap? Um, and as happens in a lot of places, when you have this increasing power gap, it leaves the people at the bottom, the rural women, vulnerable to exploitation by the men at the top. Uh, the wealthy urban men. So I really tried to explore how this is panning out. I talked to um, young women who'd experienced uh, sexual assault. Um, one scholar I talked to kind of explained it that uh, when China was under Mao, when it was very socialist, it was sort of androgynous. Uh, men and women were put into identical roles. People wore identical Mao suits. But when reform started, males really kind of tried to uh, recapture masculinity and left uh, women to be more feminine and to essentially decorate a male world, as one scholar, I quote, put it. Um, and you do see this in a lot of ways, and I think that this is one way that illustrates that. Um, but again, this is something I tried to depict in uh, individual stories of women going through this. And again, so part of this relates to the gender imbalance. When you have this surplus of men, uh, one of the implications is a rise in sex trafficking, uh, in harassment of women, in the commodification of women. Uh, bride prices are going up and uh, marriage in a lot of places becoming more commodified when uh, basically it's a race to, to accumulate the most capital to attract a spouse. So these are some of the uh, social issues I try to capture in my book. There's a lot more than I mentioned here, uh, but hopefully this will entice you to read more. Uh, but basically uh, the overarching message that I'm trying to get across with this is that the stereotype of uh, youth that have been bought off by materialism, economic growth, and spoiled. This is especially a stereotype within China of the young generation. Uh, I think that's flawed in a lot of ways, and I try to illustrate how things are still very tough for a lot of young people. And a lot of these uh, kind of weird side effects that have come along with things like China's one-child policy, 
uh, its growth in certain areas faster than growth in other areas uh, is having uh, very profound impacts on a lot of young people. So I really am trying to portray this. And on the other hand, um, how expectations are quite high among young people in a lot of ways and people are becoming less inhibited about speaking out. So when you have these two trajectories of people willing to speak out more and more, being more demanding, and on the other hand, the reality being a lot tougher, that's going to be interesting to see how that intersection uh, unfolds in the coming years. But uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you want to see any of the charts that I've used here, you can go to the link at the bottom of the screen. Uh, thanks again. Take care.